I'm proud to introduce someone who I met at the Northside Democracy for America event. Her name is Judge Sandra uh, Ramos. She's a, a Palatite Court candidate, First Division. So I think for our viewers and subscribers, can you, you've, you've sent me your bio, and it's fantastic because you're a defender. You've also been helping out veterans. Can you just give us like a short background to who you are and, and what, you, what, what you're about? Okay, um, the name on the ballot is gonna be Sandra Gisela Ramos. Mm -hmm. I'm a first generation uh, Mexican and born and raised on the southeast side of Chicago, the, what's called South During South Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, went to DePaul University, went to DePaul Law School, uh, former ASA, Assistant State's Attorney for eight years. Uh, then I started my own practice, SG Ramos Limited, which is a very fancy name for just me, mm -hmm. across the street, hanging her shingle, and became your public servant in 2010 uh, in the criminal area. I asked for the assignment branch 48, which I was very fortunate to get, that's at 51st and Wentworth, mm -hmm. because I wanted to do things differently. I wanted to address bond situations that I thought were oppressive, that didn't fit um, what I was seeing on paper. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's a presumption of innocence that we have right. to contend with. And while we're doing that, uh, 100,000 cash bond or 200,000 cash bond is, it just secures someone's incarceration. And let's look at the charge itself. Let's look at the background. Let's review this. Let's mm -hmm. balance this out. Now, because uh, we have a, a national audience, we're trying to introduce them to Chicago politics. We're letting them know the history of Chicago and also all candidates. Okay. Assignment 48. What does that mean for our viewers and subscribers? Branch 48 uh, is Branch a felony 48, yeah. preliminary hearing courtroom mm -hmm. located in Englewood. Um, it is no longer open. It was closed down I closed it down in uh, January of 2019 so that is the second step after the bond hearing where an individual is taken before the judge so that there can be a hearing to determine if there is sufficient or probable cause to continue detaining this person or to continue the charges right um, and that's an opportunity to rebalance and what's going and, on and this is for defense or uh, this is a uh, well, I sat there as the presiding judge, so I would have my anywhere from 100 mm -hmm. plus cases, right. um, many detainees, mm -hmm. and um, I would hear the preliminary hearings. Right. And it's a burden of proof. So the state has to uh, meet their burden of proof. It wasn't presumed just because someone's charged that right. that should just rifle through the system. Right. Everything received the benefit of my last. 25 years experience prior to that, actually going on 30, um, to make sure that justice was done. That was critically important to me, especially when you have very young um, people of color, because that's that neck of the woods. And as a Hispanic woman, I needed to see, okay, what's the police report say? What does the officer say? How do we how do we move this forward in a just manner? Right. That was now, important. Now, now, as a judge, of course, especially as a judge candidate, I'm sure you've seen a lot of cases in regards to you know individuals basically being framed. There's, there's a lot of stories now that are coming out in regards to people basically being arrested for crimes that they did not commit and evidence being put on them. And especially that's a, that's a sad history in regards to Chicago, Cook County politics. I mean, it's it's something that this city, the state, the county is burdened with, and there's decades. Uh, of, of that history upon a lot of people. It's mostly in, uh, towards people of color. So in regards to, especially with bond hearings, uh, where you know you have an innocent person- Bond behind, reviews, bond, actually. Bond reviews, thank you for the correction. Bond reviews, I mean, there's, there's individuals that are currently detained for crimes they did not commit, but yet they are still detained and they still have to pay their way out. I mean, we're covering stories too where an individual who is innocent it still has to pay back the prison system for his extended stay for a crime that he did not commit. After and, being yeah, exonerated. Yeah, after being exonerated. What's, there's, yeah. a, there's a more correct term for yeah. that. but yeah. uh, So could you weigh in on that in regards to making that decision, especially when it comes down to someone? I mean, because right now in the city, you have people working two or three jobs just to make ends meet. But and, that is, and, that and, is yeah. different than bond, yeah. though, yeah, that, right? That, that, so yeah. so the, the yeah. amount that you would pay if you were, if you were uh, arrested and then convicted of a crime if you were for longer than a year, right? So you're in a prison, mm -hmm. um, that there is, there's some kind of daily fee, right? There's kind of a, a regular fee. And so this particular case, this is a story we're talking about, um, where this individual um, had their conviction uh, overturned, um, but was still on the hook to pay for the days that he was in prison. Did he have a choice? Really? Where's the justice in that? Right. I mean, so I there mean, are a lot you, of people are who are you're, you're speaking to the choir, I think it's very important. 
sitting where I sat in Branch 48, mm -hmm. at that level to review that bond situation in light of what I'd heard. Um, and if you don't have the money, you shouldn't be castigated. Uh, we have electronic home monitor where's the mother, the father, the brethren, the reverend, someone mm -hmm. can, especially when we're dealing with younger than 21 years old, let's put this back on the rails and make sure that we're not condemning that defendant, presumed innocent, to, to just his life will go down the wrong, the wrong road. Mm -hmm. um, it will continue forward. Um, I had, with the help of uh, some very good um, public defenders and private attorneys, who we would tailor fit it. Mm -hmm. Okay, no school, no friends, no social media. You're going to school, mom. You got to take them. You got to be at home with them 24/7, mm -hmm. or give me a second or a third person to make sure that someone is with that young. Uh, man or woman, to make sure that this transitions in the most positive way possible. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I, there, you know, there are crimes that didn't qualify for that. If you have an armed robbery, if you have a, mm -hmm. you know, an ag arson, when you're dealing with class X felonies um, and a background that's in juvenile court, my hands would be tied. Mm -hmm. If you have a case pending for a violent crime and you get picked up on another, uh, certain petitions for violation of bail bond or probation would tie my hands because they would have to go to that judge who issued the, the warrant for that. But mm -hmm. while we have um, the opportunity to assist in, in transitioning that person, let's, let's try to do that. If we have an addict, let's, let's send that to the right place. If we have someone who got off their meds, mm -hmm. let, let's get the, get the mom back here, what's going on. Um, I had an attorney who was in custody who got off her meds and uh, became this uh, was charged with a felony disorderly in Midway, and they, we got a hold of the parents in California. Get, get here, uh, held it on the call for one day. Get her on her med. Let's set her in her CIRMAC. Mm -hmm. Let's think outside the box. Okay, mm -hmm. this is not a cattle call. These are human beings. I, had, I have one quick question. You mentioned earlier um, you're talking about bond hearings, and you were talking about burden of proof. Uh, and I wonder how does that play out if it's if it's not actually on to trial yet. I mean, you you don't have, I mean, evidence isn't being s admitted into court yet there, at that there, point. There is. There uh, is already, okay. There is, the bond court heard a proffer by the state, um, but when it gets to my courtroom, it's now, it either gets indicted before the grand jury, in which case it takes it out of my hand, but not the bond hearing, mm -hmm. not the bond hearing. I can still hear that because gun cases were being indicted and that was the policy, and you can have your policy, but I can still hear the bond. Um, the burden of proof in a preliminary hearing, um, probable cause, you have to meet that. It, that's like not so low that it's So you're not adjudicating right? the veracity of the evidence really at that point. You're not you making are. a judgment. But you have an opportunity to listen but, uh, to the victim or the police officer under okay. oath and to assess them and look at the complaint. And is the complaint, um, is the complaint legally correct. I mean, sometimes the date would be wrong, the amount would be wrong of narcotics, or the location would be wrong, mm -hmm. and that's a finding of no so probable cause. So when the, the T's are dotted and the I's are crossed and you have um, reasonable evidence to proceed, that's when you get to say, okay, we do need to set uh, an amount of bond here, and then you take that evidence and weigh that and come up with basically a number? Um, when um, the case comes into my courtroom, I would hear the um, preliminary hearing, if I found probable cause, it mm -hmm. would get an arraignment date to 26 and Cal. Mm -hmm. The bond had already been set by the bond court. Oh, I see. Okay. So I get to review it. If I have an I individual see, see. that um, on the books, a second retail theft, if you have a prior conviction, becomes a felony. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's for diapers or formula, let, let's think. I, I have to uphold the law. That is... A it, it, it is however, a crime. However, let's let's talk about the bond. Right. Uh, when you think about, and I understand it's one hundred and fifty dollars a day to keep someone in custody, and I've seen the food. I mean, having been a defense attorney and seeing what they had at the station, um, that's a waste of money. Right. Let, let's figure out another way to deal with this. Mm -hmm. So, so now in regards for uh, running uh, for this office. Uh, 
when when you're when you're trying to uh, bring in reform, you know, because we have a national audience here. Our many of our viewers and subscribers live outside of Chicago, but they probably know people who live in the city of Chicago. Um, why should at least they should, they should tell their friends, hey, consider voting for this person to, for this office. Consider voting for this person to be a judge. Why should uh, why should our viewers and subscribers? Why should people here in the city of Chicago consider you to be a judge, and continue on? Okay, um, I have the experience. Um, I'm currently sitting in law division because after they closed uh, my courthouse down in its entirety, both the misdemeanor and the felony, um, I thought of this upcoming election and running for a higher court. So I went to law division, the trial section, and um, I'm working with a great group of, of judges that are very helpful. And I broadened my perspective on the civil end of law. It, it you know, it's a... It, it's heady, it's money, but it's not a life. A life is always far more critical. So I have the experience. Um, I also am very passionate about there being equal access to justice, meaning that we're going to treat everybody the same, equally, mm -hmm. um, uh, regardless of race, color, sexual preference, or identification. That's important to me. Uh, and I take a great deal of pride in the integrity in which I ran my courtroom. Mm -hmm. um, I bring that to the table, but I also add something else, a diverse point of view. Our appellate court has one Latino justice mm -hmm. and none of, uh, no Pan-Asians. Um, the last appointment of a Latinx was in 2003. That was Justice uh, Garcia. Rodolfo Garcia, wow. and prior to that was 1989, uh, Judge Cerda, and both of them are retired, and there's been in excess of 50 appointments in the last 17 years. Where are we? We are 25% of the populace, and I think when you're going to talk about things that affect our Latinx community or our Pan-Asian community, we should be part of the dialogue because it makes for a more dynamic dialogue. Mm -hmm. They know what that experience is. They know how important it is to be heard. Mm -hmm. And why aren't we part of that dialogue? We've done a lot of stories in the past where, you know, constantly across the board, people are saying there's a lack of representation, not only uh, in regards to Chicago politics, but at the law end as well. There's a lack of representation, diversity amongst judges, because this city of Chicago, it's a, it's a, it's a diverse city. Sadly, it's hyper segregated and it's horribly, it has a sad history of corruption. So, with you potentially winning this seat, you could bring in at least some form of justice and reform and representation for people who have long, who for a long time have been ignored. So, what does that mean to you as, as, as somebody who can actually represent people and, and actually make people's lives at least a little bit better? Granted, it has to deal with judging with cases, but you know, Cook County, Chicago, we have that history of people being screwed over by the law. Well, it gives them an opportunity because as you appeal, for example, in a criminal case and you automatically appeal, mm -hmm. um, you have someone who's sitting on that appellate court that identifies with her culture, with, who identifies with, with your group of Latinx, and that's a huge spectrum of people. Mm -hmm. I mean, a huge spectrum. And it, it is, in my opinion, something that makes for like I said, a dynamic and qualified person to, to participate in that discussion. Um, I wouldn't be here mm -hmm. if there had been appointments, if there was a sense of balance. Mm -hmm. um, I, I refer to this campaign as a mission, not a campaign, mm -hmm. because it needs to be done. There needs to be a voice that says, okay, politics aside, this is the firewall. The Supreme Court will hear what it will Deem it wants to hear. Right. But an appellate review is something you will have, and that's the firewall. Mm -hmm. right. And that's a critically important step between the trial court and the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. All right. So Thank one of the questions that gets often asked um, of judges in, in hearings and nomination hearings and things like that is basically... Uh, are you bringing in any partisan viewpoints? You know, is is basically how it, yeah. basically the question goes. So, do you think um, how would you how would you adjudicate um, these type of appellate court hearings? It's appellate court, right? Yes. Yeah, um, 
uh, and how much of your own politics would you bring to the table? I mean, you talked about, um, for example, in these bond review hearings, right? Uh, if, you know, it's a second case of retail theft, if it's baby formula or diapers, right? That's a, that's a thing to consider in talking about the bond. That, we, one of the settings that we have on this show is everything is politics. So... Um, I, I don't know if I agree with that because I think fair. when you okay. when you when you're talking about an individual who has lost what is the most what's the ultimate your freedom mm -hmm. right there okay give me a uh, uh, a uh, an order you can't go to that store you can't be in front of the store you can't you know because like I said we have uh, many different types of cases that would happen around the store it could be delivery it could be you know. Um, and so the terms of the bond become, if you're back there, I'm going to reevaluate. Mm -hmm. Well, this is pending in my court, or they'll violate you in another court. Um, how much does your freedom mean to you? Mm -hmm. um, you got to put that in the perspective. But, but when you're dealing with addiction, of course, there are other things. Um, the politics of that are ignored. Mm -hmm. If you look at a Englewood, it, it you know... It's disenfranchised. A neighborhood that's also being gentrified. There's now uh, actually yeah. part of West Inglewood. There's now Inglewood and West Inglewood, yeah. which, is, which never existed Sort of before. like Humble Park? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, and that aside, I'm dealing with the people. The people who have dealt with that disenfranchised generationally. Mm -hmm. And I want to do that following the law, of course, but with an eye that says, um, you know, when you have... Uh, well, he was in a high narcotic trafficking area, you know, it would start and it would be, you know, I'm sure he would love to live in Lincoln Park. It just didn't work out for him or her. So let's put some balance, some humanity in that mm -hmm. and work with that. It, it's unsustainable to throw away a, a, the number of young people I saw. There's got to be a better way. Mm -hmm. And as a judge, you know, to educate them. Uh, to have them in my courtroom and tell them this is a process you don't want to be a part of um, and to uh, instill in them. You know, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. It wasn't a nice area. But, you know, my parents were very stern people that, you know. <laughs> Fellow south sider right here. Yeah, so, yeah. I, so I understand so, about the south so side you, of Chicago. If you I'm made the, the young angry, we're going to, you know, we're going to deal with that at home. It was mm -hmm. very strict. And that structure is lost. But when you look around and it's looking better now. Yeah. Flashback 20 or 30 years, it was just like nobody wanted to. You're in, that's your reality. That mm -hmm. is, and that's hard. That's hard to expect that you're going to you know, grow a rose garden when you're that disenfranchised. So what can we do? I embrace that it, I, I'm a public servant. Mm -hmm. And in the appellate court, this is not my seat. It's our seat. It's for the people. It's so, for the people. So then, uh, final question for our viewers and subscribers, if they want to learn more about your campaign, find you online and on social media, where can they learn more about you? Uh, can you please tell them? SandraForJustice.com. Oh, that camera right there. SandraForJustice.com. Um, we also had Vamos con Ramos, which, you know, it's Latin. Um, to go with Ramos. Um, it is Punch173. And thank you so much for having me here. Absolutely. Sure. And we are looking forward to fo uh, following up with your campaign. Here's hoping for all the best. This is Kit Cabello with Hard Lens Media. I want to thank Paul DuPont for joining us. Let us all do what we can to build a better future. If you want to learn more about Hard Lens Media, go to our website, hardlensmedia.com. Learn more about our social media page on our social media pages. There you find our, our podcasts, our YouTube channel, Twitter, Facebook. Please consider supporting us on Patreon. Peace to you guys. See you guys tomorrow at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time.